Hello, welcome to the March 18th, 2022 Club Cubase live stream. Uh, my name is Greg Undo. I'll be the host for the live stream today. I'm going to do a quick audio test, make sure everything is coming through okay. Bear with me just for a second. All right, everything sounds fine. So once again, my name is Greg Undo. I'm going to be the host for the live stream today. Uh, if you have not attended a live stream before, how it works is you could ask questions in the chat field or simply um, or simply just send me an email. If it's a more complex situation, you could email me at clubcubase at steinberg.de. Uh, and then we will try to get through all the questions uh, chronologically as asked in order. So my ability to answer questions in real time is... Uh, I will try to catch up, but there will be a delay by the time you ask a question to when I get to it as we answer uh, questions throughout uh, the session. So if we could try to avoid asking the same question over and over again, if you don't get an immediate response, that's appreciated. Uh, also, when asking a question, if you could specify which operating system, which level of Cubase you have and which version. So you could say, I'm running you know, Cubase LE, I'm running Cubase Elements, Cubase Pro, version 11, 10, your, you know, version 10, version 12, or if I'm running on Mac or Windows, that information is helpful. Um, we should have about four or five hours after the live stream tonight, we should have all of the topics covered in the live stream uh, with timestamps. So you should be able to uh, go back and refer to specific timestamps uh, that have gone on in the particular live stream. So as we work with that, and if you wanted to search for previous live streams, uh, you could go to uh, cubaseindex.com. We want to thank Jan for creating that site. Uh, and that you could just kind of search and it'll go through two years. We just celebrated it kind of since we ramped it up uh, in during COVID. We just celebrated our two year anniversary yesterday. Um, so I think we're at 1,883,000 1, views and 17,163 questions answered and something like 713 hours of live streams that we've done in the last two years. I want to thank everyone for being a part of the wonderful community. I uh, want to also give special thanks to two people that serve as moderators. So we have Jazz Dude and Agent K. They're not Steinberg employees. They just really kind of do this out of uh, kindness at heart and for the benefit of the community. So thanks to them. And another wonderful resource of information that you could check out on uh, Steinberg products and Steinberg related info. You could check out the Cubase Nation Discord. The Jazz Dude does a lot of work on uh, compiling. So there was, you know, fantastic information done there. So special thanks and kudos to Jazz Dude for that. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, so we see from Oren Bynum, good to see you on the live stream. Uh, will you please explain what is going on with the arrow key doing enlargening in the lower zone in Cubase 12? I want to use very audio and be able to see it large. How do I control the boxes? Uh, what I was trying to say is that there are two boxes that show up in the lower zone, and when I click on the arrow to enlarge, now I can't see very audio tab or the scale assistant tab. Please help. All right, so if we have a particular area here, we could say, okay, if we want to do very audio editing, and we go, a lot of times when we do very audio, uh, you may see kind of the contents here and doing a lot of very audio editing within the actual, um, let's say I'll just do a quick analysis so we can get the segments here. So if we're doing a lot of very audio, sometimes we may want to go full screen. So we would click on this little arrow to take our, um, to take our sample editor to full screen. And what you have to do, and I realize this is kind of a nuisance, is just go to the Very Audio tab again, and then just click on Edit Very Audio, and then you can see all the different settings. So the state isn't carried over. Unfortunately, I've tried to, I've mentioned that as feedback in the past, but if you now just select the Very Audio tab and click on Edit Very Audio, then you could do the editing and see all of the scale assistant functionality there. So once we kind of, uh, and I think once it, We've done this, you know, a couple times that it will stick. So now if I go a second time, I think it will take us directly back to very audio. 
but the first time is orange just select the very audio tab and then click on edit very audio and then you could work with it in full screen and then if you close it you'll go right back to your uh lower zone editor so give that a try orange okay so we see uh just from hepwa says, after a year trying to get my Reaper interface to look like the Cubase one, I bit the bullet and saw when I saw Cubase 12. Very excited. Quite a learning curve, honestly, but well done. So we're, gla we're glad to have you in, in the Steinberg family. And welcome to the live stream. And we hope to see you on future live streams. Uh, so we just see uh, from Dallas LaRue just says, uh, can you tell us something about your backup process? Uh, how many different ways? And do you have an opinion of Carbonite? A lot of times I have a lot of my stuff in the cloud. I, I don't do commercial projects a lot uh, where I need to have, you know, multiple copies. Um, but a lot of times what I would, I have, I'm not familiar with Carbonite. Um, I would tend to maybe... I don't, I'm not sure if that's one of the services. I know that there's one a couple years ago that could be causing problems. It was constantly kind of backing up like while you were doing stuff and it's maybe fine for word processing, but if you're recording 24 tracks of audio. So I think, you know, what a lot of people do is to back it up to um, like a Dropbox is pretty convenient or just, you know, buying inexpensive USB drives. And most people I know will back it up to two different locations just in case there's a flood or something in the studio. But maybe some other people could share some um, backup processes that they use. And if anyone is using Carbonite. All right. And we see Luca joining us from Munich. Thanks for joining. All right, and we see Captain Energy Music from. Uh, so we see you know, Captain Energy Music. He's from Pennsylvania. Thanks for being here. Okay, so we see a question from Oren. Uh, Hi, Greg. Will you please explain again how you can differentiate between your original vocal and your duplicated vocal when you're working in Very Audio 12 and hear the vocal parts? Okay, so let me just jump to. activate this project and as we do the live stream if you learn something new make sure that you do hit the like button and also if you are watching live please feel free to introduce yourself and tell us where you're from it's always interesting to see all right so i'm going to come over here and i'm going to so one of the things that i often do if we want to you know duplicate parts to to differentiate it is so let's say i'm going to duplicate this track and a lot of times we see people get caught up and they do very audio editing on one of the tracks and then, you know, they're like, okay, I want to raise this note here to make a harmony and it changes it in both. So what we want to do is, because very audio is going to be editing the particular audio file. So, and these two tracks, even though they're different tracks, are still playing the same exact audio file. So if we want to duplicate that, and do very audio editing, it's probably best to come here and then once you're done, just choose bounce selection and then replace. So now we have a different unique audio file. Um, so if I was editing these two, uh, we could just say control or command E and then we could see these in our very audio editing here. And once we have, and, th and this is, could be slightly different in version 12, uh, but you could just switch between, in version 12, we could switch between what is the active part that we're editing. And if we had these as different colors, just to make it uh, clearer, I could just come over here. So I'd say, I want my harmony to be red. We could now at this point uh, colorize, show colors based on, the events. So now when we go to edit very audio, I could just say, we'll edit very audio between these two that will come over here due to quick analysis that this will be red for the harmony part as well as we could just kind of see that 
the main part here will be yellow. So as we switch between the different segments, those could both be colorized differently. So let me know if that works for you. All right. Um, okay, so we see, uh, hello, sir. How do we install VST sound? I'm a bit lost. I'm on Cubase Pro 12. Thank you in advance from Ali. Um, so really all you have to do, there's a utility that could simplify this process. Um, so we come over here, it's called the Steinberg Library Manager, and this is installed within uh, Cubase 12. So if we wanted to just come and say, okay, I want to go to like my Cubase sound files. Um, Any time that you see a VST sound file. So once, once you're in here, you could choose kind of a path. Uh, so we could just choose your default library, default location, you could choose this. And then once you right click on a VST sound file, um, all it's gonna do is you, you could right click on it and say open in the Steinberg library manager or double clicking on it like a .vst sound file. You could just double click on it and it will launch this program and then it could move it automatically to the particular location. So try just double clicking on it and that will go to your default location. And then if you need it to move it to a different location or remove different uh, VST sound sets, you could do it here in the utility as well. So generally there's not an installer, just kind of double click and then that will automatically launch the VST, um, the library manager, and then that will kind of move the files if needed to the default location. All right, so we see uh, John Costigan from Kenosha. We have Benny from Sweden. Okay, so Benny's question is, uh, every time I started a new project, it automatically is set to seconds. I want it to be bars and beats. Can it be changed? Okay, so let's say I want to do a new project here, and let's say it's set. I'll just do a brand new. So right now we're set to bars and beats. So I'm gonna switch this, my primary time display, to seconds. And let's see if I do a new project. Um, so that would be set. Let's see if there's a preference. There's a default setting for this. Just take a quick look, see if there's
So I don't see a preference for it, but um, you could always just try to, um, you know, start from a template that's set. Um, but if it's kind of going back and forth, if you hit the period key on your computer keyboard, you could just kind of toggle there, but check to see if your primary time display here is set to seconds and maybe you have it set to bars and beats here. Um, so yeah, it could be try setting it directly from here. So let's say if I have that set to time code and we do a new project. So it's, yeah, it seems to, mine just seems to default to bars and beats. Um, I could do some more research, Benny, if you wanna email me. All right, so we see Keybase Junkie on the live stream, and we have Soren from Sweden. All right, um, all right. So we see from a question from Dallas Larue: uh, When I have an event in musical mode and then duplicate that event and glue them together, musical mode goes away for that event. Uh, is there a way around this? Okay, so let's. So I think that once you're gluing stuff together that perhaps you're turning it from an event into a part. So let's say if I come here. And we have this event in musical mode. All right, so we're going to duplicate it. And then let's go ahead and glue these together. So I think if we go into, so, you know, once we glue, that kind of changes the state uh, to parts, you know, in a part, we could think of it as a collection of independent events, but let's see if we could, in the part editor, if we could place it into, because we could think of a part as containing multiple events. Let's see if we are in the part editor here. And I'll go ahead and, so when I do this, let's say I'm in the part editor and we're playing back at 120 beats a minute. And now we play back at, let's say 88. So the, the events are still playing in musical mode. Uh, let me just, so it seems, you know, like when we had duplicated this and glued it together, so now it's in a part that, you know, it's carried over the different events here. So when we look at it in the part editor, we can see musical mode. So if I just want it to, Again, just go through different tempo changes to make sure it's responding to musical mode. So you may not see musical mode as a selection, but each of the events within the part still seem to be responding to musical mode. Okay. All right, so we have a question. Uh, is it known when authoring Dolby Atmos will be available in Cubase Pro 12? So it's been announced that it will be in the first maintenance release. So I know it's in testing now, uh, but not a date hasn't been announced, but probably pretty soon.
All right, so we just see, hi, how is it to put an instrumental in time in Cubase since I put since I put it, but it does not enter synchronization with Cubase? Thank you very much. Um, so I'm not sure if it's a MIDI part or an audio part, but let's say if I take a drum loop here and I drop it into the project, and right now uh, we could select the event. If we know, if, if the tempo is known, of the event, like a lot of drum loops. So now when I come here, let's say I, I have my project at 144 beats a minute. You know, we could just have, you know, different tracks be in musical mode or not. So if you select the event and you see this little uh, quarter note here with this little squiggly line that indicates that it's in musical mode. So now that it's in musical mode, come here and just say 100 beats a minute and the audio or MIDI will automatically follow so this could also be done at the track level so audio we could do it on in particular events and for MIDI uh, we could do it at the track level to switch between musical and linear mode uh, and so and we could also have the track be in linear mode where the events as we change the tempo won't shift in time. So let me know if that's what you mean when you say instrumental. So I'm not sure if it's audio or MIDI. Okay, so we see a question from Robbie Bowling. Going forward, other than a few exceptions, should we only be downloading VST3 plugins? You know, VST2 plugins will, you know, Steinberg has announced that they will still be supporting it for, uh, you know, two more years in the host applications. If you're running on an Apple M1 processor, VST2 plugins, since their development is stopped in 2008, won't ever be native for a Apple M1 processor. So if you have an Apple M1, that's when it's critical. If you have like an Intel-based Mac, then it's not really, um, it's not such an issue. The VST2 plugins work. Uh, in general, VST3 will give you, you know, better performance and better features. So if you have the choice between VST2 and VST3, I would always, I would always go for the VST3. But it's more critical if you're on an M1 Mac, so. All right, we see Sable Winters and Tim Weinheimer on the live stream. Great to see you both. Thanks for joining, both in California, one in Northern, one in Southern. Okay, so just uh, seeing a question, uh, please, your email, please. So you could uh, send it to uh, club clubcubase at steinberg.de. So... All right, and we see Dan Freeman from Atlanta, and also we saw Sir Robert from Atlanta. Thanks for joining us. All right, so we just see a uh, question, how to how connect the chord track? Um, so if we have a chord track on an event, uh, so if we want to connect it to a, like, to a MIDI part or to audio to have it follow, um, we'll go ahead and show that. Let me know if you wanted to do connect in a different way. Okay, so let's say I have a Rhodes patch here. And I want it to the chord track. So as we enter in chords here, we could choose to uh, monitor through particular tracks. So I could just say, okay, I want this to always go through the roads patch. So as I enter in chords, we can just come over here. So you could do that, or if you wanted it to, like as we play, if you wanted particular tracks to follow, uh, the chord track, what you could do, you know, if you have notes in it already. So let's say if I come here, let's, I'll just take these particular chords. And 
And if I wanted the MIDI data here to follow the chord track, all you'd have to do, let's get this open here real quick. Let's see if my Mac's gonna wake up. Just restart my Cubase real quick here. Sorry about that. So if we wanted a track to follow the chord track, really all we have to do is just set it up. Uh, and we, if we go to the inspector, we could go to the chords there. I'll show it to you real quick. So if you want like, you know, tracks and we can do this for monophonic audio, like for vocals or bass, or if you wanted to do it for MIDI, all you'd have to do is select the chords from the inspector tab. And at that point we could tell it to follow the chords. So as soon as we go to a MIDI part, we would go to the chords here and you'll see follow chord track and we could choose to just follow the chords or the scales or only root notes if it was gonna be like a for a bass part. So let me know if that makes sense for you. All right, um, so we just see a uh, question. Hi, Greg, will there be a MIDI remote template for native instruments, S61, et cetera? So I'm sure that there will be. It's generally the manufacturers of the controllers that will be creating those. So, but there's already, I, I saw in the Steinberg forums where people are already sharing different controller scripts. So you could take a look there. But again, it's gonna be uh, where, actual customers or the controller companies will be doing uh, a lot of the work for that to get into the details of their controller. We were just saying, uh, just mentioned there's a lot of native instrument device users. Yeah, there's lots of Nectar and Akai and M-Audio and you know, so all sorts of different uh, devices and controllers that people are using. All right, so we have Omar checking in from France. And Jeff Zabelski from Chico, California. My chat field just jumped. We have Crocant A, Crocant from, uh, from Los Angeles, thanks. And we see Best Green Jesus from San Francisco. Uh, so I just see, hello, Mr. Cubase. Can you please share your Nectar Panorama P4 MIDI script? Uh, thanks in advance. Um, yeah, so if you want to email me at clubcubase at steinberg.de, uh, I'd be happy to uh, make a quick, I, I'd be happy to share my script of a Nectar Panorama P4. I'll be happy to send it right after, um, right after the live stream, so.
All right, so we have a question. Uh, hi, Greg, is there a way to undo changes made to plugins added to insert? I noticed that undo and redo uh, only on things done on tracks. So let's say if I come here to uh, my mix console and we have uh, an in, let's say I just have an insert here and I adjust the parameters Okay, so when we get deal with the mix console and with plugin parameters, we can just come over here. We see this little local undo here within the mix console. So instead of control or, or command Z for undo, if you hit option or alt. So now I could come here and anything in the mixer. So let's say, okay, I came here, I added a plugin. And now I had adjusted these parameters in the plugin. I adjust the EQ. Let's adjust the volume again. Let's adjust the panning. Let's turn off the phase. So now everything that I just did, as we watch, will be able to be undone, including our plugin windows. So if I just wanted to come here again, we could just have unlimited undos and redos of all of the parameters that we've adjusted. So I come here and if you wanted to see a more detailed listing of all that, you could just, if you go to the full screen mix console and you could do that by hitting F3, uh, you could actually see your version history here. So you could see kind of a list of all the functions that you've done and just say, oh, I messed up everything that I did starting from that point. So you use uh, Alt or Option plus Z, and we could think of a Control or Command Z for doing uh, more functions with, uh, you know, for editing functions and Alt or Option Z for dealing with Mix Console. Okay, so just saying maybe the default track time type instead of a preference. Um, so to, this, to the earlier questions in the preferences, uh, someone mentioned it's in the project setup. Thank you for reminding me of my brain cramp. Uh, so project time displays, so try to set it here um, and see if that makes a difference. You know, so maybe that would do the trick to set this here to bars and beats. Thanks for the suggestion. All right, so we see Kerwin Young checking in from Hotlanta, and he's excited about the recent Nuendo news. So, all right, so we just see uh, which mail was it again uh, to Greg? So it's probably uh, Club Cubase at Steinberg.de. I see Jazz Dude added it. Thank you, Jazz Dude. All right, wonderful to see Mandy Lane on the live stream. All right, um, so we just see Jeff Sabelski says, I heard a rumor in Nuendo 12 is simmering and shimmering for its release next month. I would like every German citizen to remember to take your one a day multivitamin. Thank you very much. So yeah, I think it's coming along nicely. So. All right, so we have a question from Andy Lane on how do you use the new crossfade editor? So let's go ahead and take a look. So it's really gonna be kind of the same, a lot of the same functions. So let's say if I was crossfading between two events here. All right, so I would just hit X. So we still crossfade kind of the same way. And I think, I'm not sure if the crossfade editor, the extended one is in elements or if it's just in pro. But now when we double click, we can see our crossfade editor. Um, and at this point we could adjust, you know, like, okay, I wanted to take the volume adjustment here. We could decouple equal gain. So if I wanted to, you know, have a different fade in from my fade out volume points, we could also choose to have independent fade 
curves. We could use different presets here. You could audition just the fade out or just the fade in. And let me just make sure I, after I restart it, I probably don't have my audio connections here. So if we wanted to just kind of play only the cross, play only the crossfade, we could do stuff like that. Now, one of the things that's really kind of critical when we do like the new crossfade editing is, and this happens a lot with, let's say if I have multiple crossfades, So let's say I want to crossfade these two, these two events here. All right, so now let's say if I had a crossfade here, one of the things that's really important, let's say if we look at like these crossfades, and I will just come over here, and this is a crossfade editor that had migrated down from Nuendo. So anytime that we would nudge, you know, a lot of times if you do extensive crossfade handling, you may just come over here and kind of nudge particular events. But if we want it to, as we do nudging on events, a lot of times we have a chaining mode. So I could just say, okay, we want to, uh, so if we have this, and this is previous Cubase's behavior, if I would nudge, the crossfade, we could see that while I'm adjusting the positioning of this crossfade, that this crossfade and every crossfade after are kind of getting messed up and screwed up. But now when we go into chaining mode, and we'll just say until end, now as we do nudging on the crossfades, we can see that all the subsequent crossfades after will be retained for you. See, Mandy is amazed by the pro version, so we're glad you're happy with it. Uh, so we see, hello, have you planned a tutorial about classical orchestration and film music? Um, I haven't, but if you have like particular things, I mean, you know, those are kind of broad topics and I don't mind covering them, but you know, if there's a particular thing of how you wanted to use Cubase and those are kind of often could be independent of Cubase and we kind of focus on, you know, using the Steinberg solutions. So if you have a question on, you know, how to do this for film music or I'm, I want to accomplish that, you know, that would be better, but I'm not a film composer, uh, but I could help you with, you know, different techniques to get your, uh, you know, to get your different work done for film and for orchestration. And, you know, I grew up playing in orchestras and all through college. Um, so I understand it, but you know, if you have a particular application that you want, I'd be happy to help you with that. Um, but that's really kind of more the focus is how to use Cubase to do something. So see Cubase Junkie says, uh, the very audio snap vocals to scale is a really nice feature as well as the FX modulator. So glad you like those. Andy Lane saying she tried very audio yesterday. It's better than Melodyne, so that's great. It's nice to have the integration. Okay, so we see from a uh, question uh, from Dallas LaRue, can Razor be used in place of the maximizer and brick wall limiter in the master bus? Certainly, so anywhere that you would put a limiter and this is, if you're not familiar with uh, Razor, we could come over here. Um, and this is going to be a new uh, limiter plugin. So when we come over here, you could use it, uh, you know, on your master bus, certainly that's probably the most appropriate place. I have a feeling 
that as people try it out, that it's just going to be living on a lot of people's master buses. So. All right, we have Stefan checking in from Sweden. Okay, so we see from uh, Best Screen Jesus, uh, which preset parameter changes the color of the grid lines when dragging it? I have a dark background and the line it shows is pitch black. Okay. All right, so. So let's see the grid lines here. So we see the grid lines here. So as we do this, um, which preset parameter changes the color of the grid lines when dragging it? Um, so I'm not sure if dragging it is if it's, uh, if you're dragging it with like a, the time warp tool like the warp grid, if that's what what you're dragging there, but you, you could see kind of the white area there, or if you're dragging an event, um, but you kind of see the white outline to indicate like the start. Uh, so let me know, um, but we'll take a quick look also in the preferences and if we go to our color schemes, you could adjust in the editor area background, the grid lines color here or the project area back line. So, so maybe that would help, but if you could maybe let me know what you're dragging, that would be helpful and I, I could maybe understand it better on my end. All right, wonderful to see Michael Pierce and Nick on the live stream. So it says Michael Pierce just saying he spent a day mixing and still haven't really shifted his projects to Cubase 12. Must do this. So I think you'll enjoy it. Let's see, Mandy Lane's also liking the new supervision. That's great. Okay, so we have a question from Petty Labaton from the Netherlands. Uh, uh, I'd like to move all of my VST instruments slash libraries from current position to a brand new separate SSD disk. So once again, if you come to the library manager, and then if you just come here, you could just change. I think you could change the default location just there and it'll move, or you could just select all of these and then click move and then choose the new folder. So again, this is the Steinberg library manager, which is installed with Cubase 12. Uh, and then you could just click on move there. And I just see kind of a follow-up. Can I do just that with the new Steinberg library assistant? So yes, you can. All right, so we just see from uh, Jay Hatchie, he says a uh, question, uh, having a problem opening old tracks in Cubase 12, they open up grand, but no audio or MIDI is being triggered by clips. Uh, I've tried my audio connections and I reassign project audio folder, any ideas? Make sure that you don't have, you know, if it's, you know, if you don't see any, if there's no audio playing back at all, 
uh, or some tracks are playing audio. You know, I've seen sometimes where some tracks will be going through a plugin and a plugin isn't working in the newer version. Yeah, you know, maybe it's an older plugin. So see if there's some pattern like oh, all the tracks are playing are going through a bus and this bus has a plugin that's no longer working. You know, so I think it's going to be probably something like that. All right, uh, so we have a question. Um, is it possible to drag and drop samples from the media bay on the right side to pads in Groove Agent? Pretty sure you can, so let's come over here quickly. So let's say I just have some blank pads. We'll come over here to our media bay. So let's say I just want to drag and drop kicks on. So we could just do it just like that. Um, and second question, is there a mute button for the pads when stacking multiple samples? So each of the pads, you could just click right there and that would be the mute for the particular pad, so you have a mute and solo on the individual pads in Groove Agent. So let me know if that does the trick for you. All right, so we have Alan Nielsen checking in from Denmark. Thanks for joining and being a part of the community today. Uh, so we see how to get rid of tired, uh, how to get rid of eye lock pop ups of expired trials. So generally, what happens, and it's kind of annoying that it happens, but it's really up you know, how I lock deals with it. So it's kind of out of our realm. But a lot of times, once you do that, um, you could remove the particular plugins, you know, from your, uh, you know, from the system that are expired. Um, but it's kind of a eye lock that's causing that. And, you know, Cubase is rescanning the particular plugins. So you could, you know, if it's like VST2 plugins, you could go into the plugin manager and, you know, maybe put all of the, if there's, you know, probably, you know, if there are VST2 plugins, you could probably go into like the VST2 plugin folder and be able to remove those or go into your VST3 plugin folder and just manually remove those. So every time, you know, there's a, you know, new version, it won't automatically keep doing that, but it's just uh, how iLock has it set up. So I know it's annoying. I went through it as well. Right, and we have Michael Teams from Weatherford, Texas, and he's happy because it's Friday, and I think we're gonna start with our virtual ice cream and soup. I look forward to it every live stream. All right, uh, so we have, uh, hi Greg, Emmanuel from France. Uh, when, I, when I press play in the sample preview window, right side of Cubase, I can't hear anything. Could you help me out on this one? So we could think of this as basically there's no audio assignment. There's no track for these to live in when we do this. So this actually gets routed through the control room. So try going to your uh, studio menu and don't go to your studio setup, go rather to your audio connections and try coming over here to your control room. And you, what you want to do is to right click and you'll be able to add a monitor and set the routing there. And in the outputs, and this seems counterintuitive at first, just set this to not connected. Uh, so if I switched these, So I will have my output there. Then when I go to audition, I don't hear anything. But again, it's because these files aren't on a track, so it doesn't know where to assign it. So go to your audio connections and set the outputs 
probably, and this seems counterintuitive at first, but you just set it once, and don't worry about it, set that to not connected, but still have a stereo output. And where your monitors are connected, set that to the Yamaha, uh, set that to your audio interface where it's going out, and now you could just preview away. All right, Michael Teams wants people to smash the like button. So Jeff Sabelski's a proud smasher number 38. All right, so I just see from Cubase Junkie, the Steinberg vocoder should come back. So I think we just kind of uh, bundled a third-party vocoder, but I think it'd be cool to have a vocoder. I still miss kind of the old uh, orange vocoder from ProSonic. Just such a very bold interface. But we used to distribute that way in the old days, 20, 25 years ago. All right, so Nix is indicating that his kids will help with the virtual ice cream eating. So that's good. Without the, so with, without your kids becoming hyperactive from sugar, so. Uh, so we see a question from Chuck Green. Any way to change the event mute color to something different than bright white? Um, kind of like what we see here. Uh, I don't think that there's a way to change that because a lot of times when stuff is recording, it could turn red. Uh, so, and a lot of times people may not have a color. So if we come here and we add an audio track and if we have an event here, it's kind of, it could be gray. So, but let me just take a look in the preferences. I don't, I mean, don't think there is, but I'll take a look. Let's try this to focus color, but I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that's fixed, um, but I'll mention that. Oh, I'll try this one more time. Yeah. So sorry about that. All right, so we see uh, P Zone 36 just saying hi from the UK and thanks for the undo tips. Um, See, Ramona Diaper says, uh, nice, I drop in for two minutes and learn something useful. You rock, Greg. Thanks. All right. All right, so we have Shubus, Shubus from Panama. Thanks for joining us. My chat field jumped on me, so we'll find my spot. All right, so we see from uh, Petty says, uh, question, can I move VST, including three parties from SSD to another with the library assistant just like that. So the VST plugins, you probably want to keep in the same spot and those files are very small. 
Um, but if it's going to be any of the content, the samples generally can be, you know, most will, you know, just, I think just about every, uh, program will allow you to store your samples onto a different drive. Um, so, you know, with VST two plugins, you could move it over, but generally it's not advisable, but you know, with, um, but the library assistant, uh, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but the library assistant is really kind of for Steinberg content uh, and not intended for third parties because you, most companies will have some method of moving it. But with Cubase, you could have all of your instruments like Halion or Groove Agent and sample content. So the, um, so the library assistant is really intended for Steinberg but you could probably, most companies will have something similar or, you know, you could check with them. Uh, so question, can I tune very audio to other than 440 Hertz? So, you know, as we do tuning in very audio, it's going to be set up for, uh, like when we snap events, it's going to be set up you know, for tuning to 440 hertz. So we want to come over I here. Um, you know, as we snap, you could obviously tune to any pitch that you want within Very Audio. So as soon as we come here, if you hold down like the shift key, but if you wanted to snap to a particular scale, you know, with shift, Hi. you can do fine tuning and kind of place it anywhere that you want. Um, but if you want it to automatically snap, it's going to be set to 440 Hertz. But what some people will do is, you know, select the audio event here and then just adjust tuning in fine tune. So if you're at 442, you could fine tune down minus two, or if you're 432, you know, 432, you could add eight. And then as you make your adjustments here, it would be. Um, you know, that would offset the pitch as you do tuning, but a lot of times you may not hear a difference between two or eight cents. Um, you know, Okay, so we have a question from Jeff Zabelski. Uh, what's the easiest slash fastest way to match tone and timber of multi-sessions of woodwinds tracks when each session had a different mic positions and distance? Uh, you know, sometimes adding reverb and kind of uh, is, is always an old trick to kind of match stuff up like that. Um, one tool that may not be as obvious, uh, if you want it, if they're if their tones were really drastically different and you had a hard time kind of figuring out, you could come over here to uh, the Curve EQ and the Curve EQ has kind of a, you know, a if when you click on the static in match that you come over here and then you could take the EQ of one signal and have that be a take and do the EQ of the different tone and then we could, you know, match the, you know, we could match the two and apply one as the reference to uh, another to another track. So that is good for kind of matching up EQ tones. Check out the er the curve EQ with that. Uh, so we have a question. Um, is there a sound quality difference between Cubase on a Mac or PC? No. So sound quality is the same. So, All right. And we have Samson Strike checking in from Austria. Thanks for joining us today. Always wanted to go to Austria and see Vienna. It's on my bucket list. Okay. Um... So we see from Best Korean Jesus, uh, it says it meant the guidelines when using the draw line sign parabola tool. All right, so let's take a look, see if we can do that. Let's just open this up in the drawing tool. So I'm gonna switch this 
say our per, uh, I'll do a sign. Okay, so I see kind of with the dark background. So I think that's kind of fixed. Um, so like as you do that, you see where that could be um, problematic, you know, or it could be harder just to look at and kind of see the lines. But I'll I'll make sure to mention that to see if that could maybe be switched to white as we kind of enter in like we start off white um, but if you have some automation in there like some automation event you could kind of just apply the contrast like that see if i can not miss my control key multiple times in one question all right so thanks for the clarification All right, uh, so we have a question um, has to do with purchasing Cubase by a cross-grade option as I own Pro Tools in Ableton. Could you kindly explain the process? All right, so let's come over here. Thanks for interest in becoming part of the Cubase family. So let's get quickly to the Steinberg website. And we'll just look at the process for doing it. So, okay, we want to go to Cubase uh, and we'll do buy Cubase 12 Pro. Um, and at this point, we, you'll see full version, but you could choose competitive cross grade. Um, and then, so these are all the different items uh, that you that are available. And let's see if there's like a little, let's see if we add to cart now. I think that there is some, let's see if we go to But I think you may have to, at some point in the process, um, you know, have some verification of it. Uh, I haven't done it in a while, but I'm sure if you kind of go through this process, that would be kind of all you have to do. You don't have to give up your license of your other programs. We don't want them. Um, and that's really all you have to kind of go through that process. All right, wonderful to see Spike Williams from Cardiff in Wales. I'm sure I pronounced that incorrectly. All right, so we have a question. Um, so please, how does <clears throat> one export MIDI remote script create it? So I just got a new device today in the mail. Uh, that I got the Choice OS 100. It's a cool little controller. So let's say I had this set up for my quick controls. Uh, so what I want to do is to come over here and once we click on the settings, you'll see script and then you'll see export script. And that would be all you'd have to do. Uh, and once you're in here, this is where you get import scripts as well. So once again, once you Go to select your particular device, click on the settings tab, click on the scripts tab here, and export the script. Okay, um, all 
Okay, so we have question one. Uh, I set up MIDI controls for the knobs on my contact keyboard, uh, which seem to be routed okay, but only move the controls by a tiny degree. Uh, what am I doing wrong? All right, so let's say I will come over here and add a con have a, little, like a little fader box here. Uh, I'll add, let's go to my surface editor, and I want to come here here and let's add a button or let's add a fader and I'll make this a little larger and okay let's see if I have So I'll just go do a quick learn there. So let's say this is my modulation. Um, okay, so as soon as we do this, um, you know, you could check a couple of different areas. So you'll have, um, you know, the resolution, you know, make sure that's, you probably want that set to standard. Uh, and maybe set this, set this to absolute. Now, once we've gone in and let's say, okay, we want at this point to assign that particular parameter to something. Um, so I'll just add a function to that knob. So let me come over here. I move the parameter assign that function, but also you could see scaled takeover um, and you have minimum and maximum values within the mapping assistant. So maybe it got kind of assigned there, but also, you know, check to see, because sometimes you may have, you know, controls that aren't transmitting the full range, uh, but try adding like an instrument track that you're on I'll just do for expediency sake. So, and then go to your MIDI inserts and then there is a MIDI monitor and just make sure that as you do this, that, you know, it is seeing, you know, a, a number of different MIDI messages kind of as you're uh, moving something. So you could just kind of come over there and make sure that it's, it's, your controller is actually transmitting the full range of values. All right, so we see, uh, um, so just a question. Hello, Greg. Uh, is anyone else having issues when assigning pads in the new MIDI remote section and losing the ability to play the corresponding keys from the keyboard, C1, C sharp one? So once you've defined a particular you know function for the MIDI remote, that will kind of take over it and block it from other functions. So, you know, one way, if, you know, so, it, it may not, if you wanted to use those particular functions for, you know, you know, for MIDI notes, you know, try not to assign them because otherwise, you know, the program is looking for that MIDI message not to be transmitted as to play an instrument, but for the particular control, uh, control functionality that you've defined. So, all right, Michael Teams is granted. Me, my, me, my family and myself, one gallon of blackberries and cream ice cream. So thank you. Look forward to having it with dinner. All right. So we see, how do I create vocal harmonies with MIDI? All right. So let's say, um, let me just... Say. I feel the All right, so I destroyed that piece well. Let me just. Let's 
do it on another piece. So I'm not sure if you wanted to play the vocal harmonies uh, from MIDI. So I don't think you could do harmonies uh, from MIDI in an easy way, but I'll try one plugin that comes with Cubase first. Um, and we can find this plugin. I'm not sure if this works under pitch correct. So. As we do this, I want to have my scale source be um, from external MIDI note. So as if I wanted to play here. And I want to just assign a MIDI track here. And let's route that MIDI track out to our uh, pitch correct plugin. So now as we're playing, if I wanted to just play the MIDI keyboard. So let me just come here. So, but I don't think that that's gonna play chords. So, but what you can do is if you have a MIDI part here, um, we could take the chord track and I'm gonna go to the project menu and let's get a chord track and I'm gonna create chord events. We can do this from a MIDI or audio part. Uh, so now that we know what the chords are, I could just come and select a range and let's go to our project menu. And at this point we want to go to my audio menu here and we'll just say uh, generate harmony voices. I'll do two harmony voices. And as we listen to it now from that MIDI, so you could do like that. Okay, so we see from Michael Teens, and I'm gonna answer his question just because he gave me a gallon of ice cream. And I'm easily bribable. Uh, how do you change the name of your markers in the marker track? All right, so let's say uh, I have a marker track here. Okay, and we now have different markers dropped in. Okay, so if you wanted to name these markers, so if you select a marker track and we go to uh, our marker window here, you'll see the open marker window. So we could do that, or we could just also do this by, uh, and in the description, you could just come right here. And if you hit the down arrow, you could go to the you know description of the next event without having to navigate to it. So you could just kind of come right there. Uh, but you could also, I think it's just Control or Command M will also allow you to do it. And then as you type in the marker descriptions, that would be the name for the marker tracks, just there. much better than do it the old analog tape way. So. Okay, my chat field jumped on me. 
All right, so we see, uh, thanks Greg from the Netherlands. Uh, Cubase only allows mix one and two in the control room. How do I switch between mix one and two? Um, so let's say, you know, if we, so I'm not sure if, so if we want it to come to the control room, so I'm not sure if this is in the monitors uh, or the different uh, Q mixes, but let's say if I was here, you know, once we, come over here we could if it's between different Q mixes we could just click here in the control room so I could listen to Q mix one or like the mix in the control room the external Q mix one Q mix two if it's switching between different speakers we could just see like a b c d uh, or you could switch in the monitors tab here and then you could see the Q mix switch but if you wanted to listen to the different Q mixes you could come over here listen to your internal mix and then listen to someone's Q and listen to an alternate Q mix and you could pick and choose directly there so let me know if that helps All right. Uh, okay, just reading through comments. Okay, so we just see from, uh, just says, hi Greg, just wanna say that Cubase 12 is awesome. Thanks for your help in the past stream. Greetings from Argentina. So glad you're enjoying the new version. All right, so we see from uh, Oren Bynum, uh, how do I set up my media bay back to its default settings? I did something by mistake that changed things around in the media bay. Now it's not working like it used to. So if you, you know, if you want to email me a picture of how your media bay is set up, I'd be happy to take a look at it. But you know, make sure that you know you're gonna have like your different sections here. So we have kind of the right zone where we can do kind of attribute editing. And we see the left zone. So at this point, we can say, okay, I just wanted to see my factory sounds. You could switch between logical and attributes. So if you wanted to search for particular things in each of these, we could come over here and pick, you know, different, uh, different, you know, categories if we wanted to. So if we just wanted to come over here and say, okay, I wanted this to be you know, different categories or track numbers, we could choose kind of different settings uh, directly there. So let me know if that helps you out. So, but make sure that you kind of have, and then you could have kind of the preview window here at the bottom as well. So if you wanted to just come over here to BST sound and say, okay, I want backbone samples. We can come over here. So you could go through different directory trees there. Uh, so we see question, hi guys. Uh, I was wondering where I can find a fast stereo to mono uh, button inside Cubase for mixing in mono. So in the control room, once you have your control room, you can see down mix presets and then you could just click right here. So now we're kind of everything will be in stereo and then you could then choose to monitor it in mono. So if you come here. So that's all you had to do. So in the control room, which you could just access right here and then go to down mix presets. And then you could even have a keyboard shortcut to navigate to, uh, to down mix if you wanted to, or to go back and forth between them. All right, so we have Polk Music from Atlanta, Georgia, from Atlanta, Georgia, just upgraded to Cubase 12. Great, thanks. And we hope you're enjoying your new version. 
And we see Mark Rabin on the live stream. Hope you're doing well. All right, and we see Juha from, I hope that's how you pronounce your name, from uh, Helsinki. Thanks for joining us. Always wanted to go to Finland. Okay, so I see a uh, question. In a channel editor, when comparing frequencies for masking, why is there no change in the spectrum level when I change the fader value? Um, all right, so let me just open up project, just kind of show this. All right, so let's say I have my kick and my base here. And I wanted to find, so I'm gonna to go to the channel window here and we can do kind of the comparison EQ. So I'll say, okay, we wanna look at the EQ of my, my kick drum and let's look at the EQ of the bass. So now at this point, I could see these orange frequencies are um, the bass. And if I wanted to EQ the bass, now we could see that these particular, I could EQ the bass. And if I click on my kick, and we see that the color of the EQ band changes here. Now the reason why you don't see change is because that EQ is happening before the fader. So that's why you don't see, you know, these particular e EQ changes being affected, the frequencies being affected because that EQ is pre-fader because if we think of the signal flow going from left to right uh, and that will allow you to have kind of pre-fader uh, functions right there. So that's why it's not the gain that you're seeing kind of the energy levels aren't affected by the faders. So Benny's just mentioning he loves being able to make a chord track out of audio, awesomely smooth. Um, all right, we have a question from Taylor Sapp again. Um, in 10.5 and earlier, when uh, more than one project is open, the current project automatically activates. This stopped in 11. Is there a preference to return to this behavior? Um, so let's come over here. So what would happen a lot of times, let's say if I jump to uh, a different project here, you know, we, we could just see, do you want to activate this project when opening? Um, so, you know, we have this option and, and the reason why, so if we wanted to activate, you could just do that. And the reason why, what would happen, and we would see this, sometimes we have composers and it could take like four or five minutes for them to load up their template. And what would happen is if a project was, was closed, it would automatically activate a different project. So, but it may not be the project that you want it to be activated. So you may have to wait four minutes and then deactivate it to activate another project. So that's why the behavior has changed. Um, you know, so there's lots of complaints about that. But as soon as you go to open a new project, just choose activate and then it will automatically be activated so that doing that doesn't that, you know, cause you may want to open up a project and just copy a file over. So say, oh, I really just want to take this file. I don't want to load up every single sample. I just wanted to access this file from an inactive project and drag it over to an active project. So it was just kind of more of a courtesy for the change in that behavior. So it's just really, if you just hit enter at that point, it will automatically activate the project, but it doesn't kind of force you to, uh, if you want to just copy over one particular file from a project to load up that project.
Let's see, Mark Rabin is also a fan of the uh, chord track from audio functions. It says it's, it's, it's like Cubase figures out my cover songs now. So, yeah, ever, ever since that came, anytime I got a hot mess song and I had to Cubase, I used to always ask for a chord track or the chords uh, when I was doing projects with Michael Teams and Gareth and Pablo. But since I got to Cubase 12, when I started working with it and testing, I, you know, I mysteriously didn't ask for any more chord tracks from them because Cubase could just figure it out for me. So it's a great feature. I love it. Michael. All right, Michael Pierce. Has gen has has his soup selection for the day. Uh, so it's peas, butter peas, a big bunch of spring onions, scallions, vegetarian stock, smoked bacon if that's your thing, mint and cream frotch to thicken cornbread, rook, I guess roquefort cheese on the side. It's always a good selection, Michael Pierce. Thank you. Mark Rabin is asking for the calories and sodium level. You never ask Michael Teens that. How much sugar is in the ice cream? So, all right. Uh, All right, so we see, uh, I just see kind of a comment about the down mix presets. Jazz Dude was saying he will sometimes switch between 714 or 5.1. So if you have, and someone else saying, I, I don't see that. So if you have a 5.1 bus or a 714 bus, um, then you have the options to down mix to lower, uh, like down mix preset configurations but if you're just working with stereo you'll see stereo and mono if you're working with quad you'd see quad down mix to stereo down mix to mono or 714 to 51 to stereo to mono so it really depends on which um you know what your current uh, output configuration is and then it will down mix based from there Right, so all right, um, all right, so we just see, make sure I didn't miss any. Okay, so we have a question. Um, can I change the direction of the mouse wheel when zooming in on a grid like G and H keys? All right, so if we come here. Um, so I think when we, so I'm gonna come here, let's say I hold down my control and then I move up to zoom. And this may be, let's check. On, it could be on the operating system preferences. So let's say if I come over here to mouse. Scroll direction natural. So now I'll change my scroll direction. So now as I zoom up, so I think Let's see if that changes it. It seems the same, um, but you it might change. So you know, depending on your operating system, that may do it if you change it on the scroll direction and just using kind of the mouse wheel for scrolling. So try that. Didn't seem to work on, me, on mine, but I think that's worked in the past and it may work on Windows. Okay.
All right, so let me just jump back to questions. Thanks for all the great questions. Um, okay, so we have uh, from Mark Rabin. Uh, if I export Mixer and Groove Agent 5 to Cubase, I get the Mixer channels. When I render, it still eats, still ends up as stereo, but I have to export, select new Mixer channels to get it to make audio files. Um, Okay, so let's say, you know, if we have a, a Groove Agent project here, so let me just jump back. So if you wanted to turn it into audio files, um, we could probably do it in a quicker way, Mark. Okay, so I'll activate this. And revert this quickly. Okay, so let's say I'm gonna just come and I have, let's say if I have Groove Agent set up here and I have my pattern in. Okay, and let's say that these are going to different outputs like my kick is gonna output two, my snare to output three, hi-hats, let's say output four, my overheads to output five, and my room to output six. So now when I play, uh, we'll just solo this track and we look at our mix console. We can say that these will all be kind of spread out. Um, but now if I wanted to, let's take uh, like this track here, and I'm just gonna do a render in place. And I'll go to my settings, and I'll just say, I'll just do complete signal path, and I say render. Oh. Let me just check the, my, Output configuration again. Okay. Usually we can just kind of usually just kind of catches it uh, and we'll take the outputs. Let me just make sure that in the VSTI rack. Just try my render settings again. But usually when I do, yeah, there we go. So, um, so now we could just have like the kicks, snares, all kind of just uh, rendered independently as audio. So if when you go to the render settings, uh, try just doing channel settings, and then all of the different outputs will automatically just be rendered so that you could have your kicks, snares, hi-hat, overheads, and your room mic. So, so if you're looking, um, 
as a way of kind of rent, you know, having those files automatically split out, you know, and why it's in stereo is because it's going to have stereo processing because of different effects on it. Okay, um, so we just see uh, another question. How can I create a bus mixing channel? Hotkeys are welcome. All you have to do is you could just click on T and just add a group track. So when you just click right there, and at that point, your group track is automatically added. If you wanted to select a number of tracks and assign those to a particular group, select them, right click, add, group channel to selected channels and then it will do all the routing for you. So just adding a group track. All right, so we see a question. Uh, is there a way to hot swap from the media bay in the sampler? So. Just open up a project with sampler track stuck in it. Let me see if it's in recent projects. Okay, so let's say uh, I'll just come here. Let's open up a sampler control and I'm just gonna drag this in. All right, so now, uh, but really all you have to do is just come over here and if you wanted to replace the drum loop, just drag it in. And even if we have kind of all the settings, you know, so let's say I've, you know, set up all my different parameters here. Uh, at that point, we could lock all the parameter settings and just drag and drop your samples right in. So that's all you have to do. And you could do that while it's playing as well. All right, so we have Matt, Matthew Elston checking in from London. Wishing everyone well, thank you. Thanks for joining the live stream. All right, Michael Pierce is saying, uh, time to massage the like button. Jazz dude saying subscribe and don't forget the like button or Frank Zappa appears tonight in your dreams. So I didn't get to meet Frank, but I know Dweezil pretty well. Okay, so we see, uh, hi Greg, if I press play in Cubase, there's always a short delay. So I can never start it in sync with something else. Uh, how can I get rid of this delay? I've tried everything so far. All right, so, you know, when you come over here, so that delay could be caused by different plugins. So if you look in Cubase, just to give you an idea, let's go to the full screen mixer. And there is a setting here where you could see channel latency. So as we kind of scroll through, now as we play, there's a number of plugins that are active that have lots of latency that could cause um, our, our delay to be built up. So let's, now if you wanted to, one quick way of testing this is in the bottom left-hand corner of the transport, you have a constrained delay compensation. And what that will do is bypass plugins that have a lot of latency. So. Now with that disabled, let's say I have some big plugins on my stereo bus here. So I'm just gonna go to my inserts and I'll go ahead and just activate a couple of plugins. So we see 246 milliseconds of time. I'll just add some more 
multiband compressors when not in live mode can add a lot of latency. So now when I hit play and I hit stop, there's a delay. Uh, caused just by the plugins there. So if I, so try hitting the constrained delay compensation. And then as you hit the space bar, those plugins are bypassed with, and if you do not have that on, you may have delays that are being caused by plugins. So try just using the constraint delay compensation if you haven't done that. All right, uh, so we see, uh, hello Greg. Um, so can you explain how to align two audio tracks with a new time warp warp grid? Okay, so let's come over here. I'll jump to a project. Okay. Okay, so I'll just come here and let's take a look at some warping examples. Okay, so I had Gareth from the live stream sent me a guitar part that was purposely out of time. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna select both of the events. And then all I have to do is I'm gonna come over here. Uh, so we probably have, you know, so if we wanted to manually put it in, we can come here and we'll choose free warp. Now we see this, you know, the two arrows with a clock and we see this little white vertical line. So what I could do is I'm just gonna put that white vertical line at kind of rhythmically significant points. I could say, okay, this was, um, so, you know, as we have both of these selected, I'm just gonna drop in the warp markers. And now I could just say, this note was a little early. You know, one thing to be aware of is as you work with this, you know, you may, you know, if I just put warp, you know, if I just say, oh, you know, this note here, I need to move uh, these particular notes. You know, I could kind of mess things up before or after so you know you may want to put a warp marker before or a warp marker after and now as you adjust here we can see that i move over to where it turns white and then all three parts can be moved so if you have multi mic guitars you could just kind of come right over here and be able to move them um i'll just this one is kind of a separate track so i'll just take these two and now as we get a warp, I can just kind of come right here and just warp those two points. Now, if you wanted to get rid of all of the warp markers and have the hit points, you know, we could just come over here. Let's say if I go to my sample editor um, and we go to our audio warp, we could just say reset. Um, but I could, you know, since Cubase will capture hit points when audio is being recorded, I can now just go to the real time processing and say create warp markers from hit points. And now when I switch to my warp tool, the hit points will automatically generate warp markers and I could just kind of move, you know, if someone was a little late or a little early, we could just move those events accordingly.
Um, so I just see, hello, Greg, I can't get bars and beats in my grid, only seconds, can't figure out how to get it back. Um, so if you look into transport, you'll see the primary time display. You could set that to bars and beats there. Um, and then also you could go to the right, uh, go to the top timeline, right click, and then you could choose your time formats there. So either way should work. Uh, so I see question was working on a project the other night and Cubase crashed upon launching spectral layer plugin. Is this a known issue? So I haven't really had any issues with it, but you know, with Cubase 12, you know, there is like a spectral layers update that is kind of the one that was designed to, you know, be optimized for some of the, uh, extended ARA functionality. So make sure that you do have the latest versions of each. My Chatfield jumped on me, so let me just find my spot. Okay, I think I'm in. All right, uh, so I just see a question. Um, so can you show how to stream Cubase? So what I use for the live stream is I'm just going uh, directly into OBS. Um, so, you know, and this is a free software. Um, so I have it set to transmit my computer display. And for the audio, what I do, and there's other solutions, but what I found has worked the best is I have one audio interface uh, for Cubase. So, and when I go here, I go to my studio setup. So I'm using a UR24C interface for Cubase, but, uh, and then I take the analog outputs of that and my microphone, and I connect that into a Yamaha USB mixer. And for all of my streaming, what I do is I tell the streaming software, whether it's OBS, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, uh, whatever streaming software to use the Yamaha driver. And that way I could change sample rates. I could mute myself in case I sneeze or cough. Um, and it's been, you know, it's worked great. And I don't really feel a need to change back. I could do loopbacks and stuff like that, but I don't want to, I want to be able to quickly change projects and not always have to have, you know, a setting for, uh, audio to work as well. That's how I do it. All right. So a uh, question from Rob and we probably just showed this, but we'll go over it again. Uh, do you have to detect hit points before you use the new warp function on an audio sample in Cubase 12? So you don't have to. Uh, so, you know, Cubase will automatically do, automatically come up with the hit points. So if we're on, uh, I'll just come here and let's reset our hit points. So we, I could see the hit points here, these little, uh, these little small little triangles. So those are our hit points. And now as we add... Uh, once we're in our free warp and we click, we could snap to these hit points very easily. So if I come here, say, okay, now I want to do that. Um, so you don't have to, but I find a, a easy way, you know, because if you're doing a lot of warp editing, I find it very easy when you go to the warp to you know, go to the hit points zone, we come right over here and I just say create the warp markers so that now when I go to audio warp, all of the hit points have been populated. So I don't have to add one before or one after. So now I'll just come here and okay, this note is a little early, this one's late, whatever. We could just freely move without having to manually add the particular hit points. Um, and then on the project window, you know, how you add the hit points again is come over and you'll see 
kind of switch to the time warp tool and then you'll see free warp. And at this point, you could just add your warp points and just say, okay, I'm here and now I need to move this. And we could do that for one track or as we just showed a couple minutes ago, multiply selected tracks or events. So let me know if that makes sense. All right, so we see a uh, question. Um, hi, Greg, an external device, how can I create a panel to control every MIDI channels of my Integra 7 for every channel I would like to control volume, pan, cutoff, et cetera? Thank you very much. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, I'll probably screw this up. I do this like twice a year. Um, so let's go to... Um, our MIDI device manager, and we'll add, let's say, an Integra. So we'll just do install, we'll define new. Okay, so we'll call this an Integra. Okay, so we want to have MIDI channels one through 16, let's say. All right, so let's do volume, pan, modulation. All right. All right, so now we'll come over here. Uh, let's go ahead and open the device. And I think if we come, okay, so let's add a panel. We could make it a uh, general size or on the inspector, we'll just try general size. And what we want to do now is let's add faders. Okay, so say for channel one. And as we do this, we can say, okay, this fader, I want it to be for main volume. And let's create, hit okay. And then when I go to channel two, I could drag kind of the same fader out. So we'll make it main volume. All right. Let's make sure I have this. So let's say channel two, drag it out, create that. Um, so now we could come over here and if we wanted to, okay, I wanted to do panning. So we'll say, let's do uh, knobs and I wanted this knob for channel one and I wanted that to be panning, but let's set the uh, default panning to 63. And let's go ahead create. So now when we come over here, so you could just kind of build it up just like that. So you can say, okay, now, uh, you know, we can build up kind of multiple knobs parameters. So you can say, okay, this will be reverb, this will be cut off, whatever CC message that's going to be. Uh, and then that's how you could kind of build your panel that you could access. So, All right, so we see question is logical editor for MIDI functions only. So the logical editor is for MIDI functions and then there's also a project logical editor and the project logical editor will allow you to do more like naming tracks, uh, adjusting automation, 
you know, visibility, you know, so all sorts of different functions there. But the logical editor is only for MIDI uh, devices and MIDI data. Okay, so we just see, uh, says, uh, hi Greg, thanks for all the help. Every time I use the free warp tool, the, meter, the ruler changes to seconds, then I have to change manually to beat again, how to avoid it, thank you. Um, okay, so let's say if we're in our free warp tool, uh, I'm just gonna make sure, so let's see if, I have that set to bars and beats. Um, and my master time is in seconds. So let's say my master time is in seconds, but I'm in bars and beats. Let's see if that changes it. So doing the free warping on the project window doesn't seem to adjust. It's not changing my uh, actual ruler at all um but if you have like a quick video you want to like a screen capture video and you can do that in obs for free uh and if you're going to share a link with me i'd be happy to kind of take a look at it but mine yeah as i do free warping doesn't change uh bars and beats um so but let me know if i'm doing something differently than you are All right, so we see a question. Uh, what is the best way to add Cubase to a second computer? Um, so with Cubase 12, you can you know, install it on up to three different computers. So one license can be spread to three different computers without having to move the e-licensor. So, and if you have earlier versions, all you have to do is just physically move the e-licensor and then you should be all set. You can, you know, with the e-licensor, you can install it on as many computers as you want, and just and just move the the e-licensor around. But with the new uh, Steinberg Activation Manager, you can install it on up to three computers. All right, so we have a question from Nick. Uh, what's the best way to record audio from Groove Agent patterns live in real time? Uh, so probably the easiest way is, let's say if we jump over to, okay, so I'll activate this project. All right, so I'm gonna take, uh, just revert. Okay, so I will take uh, my Groove Agent and I'm going to uh, create a group channel to that selected channel and make it a stereo group. And I want to add an audio track and its input. We want to set it to group one. So I'm going to record this channel. Let's open up Groove Agent. And I'll just go ahead and solo these different tracks. So as we play, I could just put it into record. And I'll start off with. So at this point, I'll just trigger the MIDI patterns. And let's say, so you can see that as we record and do our changes, this audio from the instrument is being sent to the group. The audio out of the group is being sent into this audio track and it's just capturing it 
in real time. And if I wanted to come to Groove Agent here and set its MIDI input from itself, I'll just say, so now I could record the MIDI at the same time as audio for my virtual instrument. And that's really all you had to do. So route the outputs from the instruments into group, into a group, and the group set it as the input for another audio track. All right, so we see Mark Raven just says, every single live stream I learned something new, me as well. Uh, I leave inspired and usually have a eureka moment somewhere between these streams. Thank you, Greg, Jazz Dude, and Agent K, and the Cubase family. So that's great. All right, so we see from uh, Daza Direct, uh, can you question, can you please show how to map notes C1 through C3 as buttons on a generic MIDI uh, generic MIDI controller? I've drawn and mapped uh, the rest, but haven't found the key notes in mapping assistant function browser, thanks. Okay. Um, all right, so if we want to, I'll show this in both uh, the generic remote. So you mentioned a mapping assistant as well, uh, but let's come to generic remote. So if we wanted to do particular functions, we'll go to our studio setup and let's go to uh, generic remote. So we want to make sure that we have our MIDI ports set in. And the easiest way to kind of do this is just to say, uh, click on MIDI learn. So I'll come here and as I hit a MIDI note, like that'll be C1, I think, or C on my controller currently. I come here, that'll be D, I go to this object. Um, so as I do this, we can see that the field, the value here, uh, the address will be populated automatically. And now whatever function that I wanted to do, so I can say, okay, I want this to open up the VST mixer. And, you know, we could just say, okay, this opened up selected channel. So when I hit this button, um, it'll now, you know, we could just have that do uh, particular functions. So there's my, my channel for that. So let's say if I come here to this, um, you know, we could just have it automatically create those particular events. Um, so let's say I wanted to do device and we'll just say, so let's say it'll just do something right obvious. So let's say I want that to add a track and let's add an audio track. So now I had this set up correctly. I could just hit that MIDI note and that will be added just like that. Uh, so let's say I wanted to get rid of that generic remote and do it via the mapping assistant. Um, we could kind of do the same thing. So I'll just come here and let's say uh, I will go to the MIDI remote into the mapping assistant. So I need to go to the surface editor and let's say I just wanted this to be uh, buttons. So I'm just gonna come and as we kind of zoom in, you can see that as I do this, these buttons were added. So I could just say, okay, let's do buttons here. And I just, so I'll just say, okay, we want these for our MIDI notes. And now when we go to our mapping assistant, I could hit the particular key and just say, okay, I want this to do fast forward. 
And when I hit this key, I want that to be rewind. So we'll select it once, then double click, and now that's gonna be assigned. So that's how you could kind of set up uh, your normal MIDI notes for either the generic remote or for the new MIDI remote settings. Uh, so we just see uh, what's the best way to get a chord track over to Dorco for. Um, so I, I don't think that there's a direct, you know, import chord tracks. Um, I know that it's kind of been in, you know, there's a lot of discussion going on between Cubase and Dorco integration currently. Um, so, but currently there, there isn't a particular way you might be able to export it as a music XML file, um, from the score editor and have that automatically carried over. You know, Memento says he learned something new in every stream, but tomorrow I won't remember half of them. Features must also be used to keep them in memory. And that's why we have an index, so you could always kind of go back and be inspired and check out Beyond's CubaseIndex.com. And yeah, as Jad's dude mentioned, so yeah, if you see something cool, just do it like three times and try to get that muscle memory locked in as well. Okay, just reading through comments. Thanks for all the great questions. Okay. Um, so we see from Paul Claridge. Uh, so Greg, can you do a separate video showing what all the terms and controls in a logical editor are, not just examples, but explain what each term means? For example, what is a container? Okay, so I, I, I could do that. I didn't. I was working. I was going to be doing some logical editors, and then I saw it was coming and going to be changed. I didn't want to necessarily do a video for the old version. Uh, but when we do a project logical editor, and I've gotten this question from friends before, uh, sometimes, you know, it's, there's a particular logic to it. And it's very, if you're, you know, some, like my friend, Fred Corey, who's been on some of the Zoom meetups, a uh, wonderful musician. He just can never get his head wrapped around. He's like, why is it called this? Why can't they just call it this? And so let's say our container type, I mean, we'll just use this as an example. Um, so when we go to the container type here, we could choose to do, um, you know, so, you know, what we want to do is to define what kind of function we do. Do we want to delete, select, transform, deselect? So we have a process here. So we want to choose that particular process. So let's say I wanted to select and I wanted to do, you know, and what do we select? Do we select an event? Do we select a MIDI note? Do we select a track? Do we select a folder track? So let's say if we wanted to do a track and a track contains events and a track can contain automation, a track can contain uh, you know, audio files and samples. So we could think of, so if I wanted to deal with the track level, at this point we would say our container type uh, is going to be equal to or unequal to folder track, track, part, or event. So this way I'm not selecting, you know, if I wanted to select the track itself as opposed to the event, I could just say I wanted to select tracks that have the name, let's say that contains 
uh, I'll go to name, and we want this to say contains forget in the in the track name. So now at this point, I'm gonna have this track selected. So I'm telling this to select tracks that contain the name forget. So as soon as we do this, um, container type is equal to, oh, so I have this set to folder tracks. So I say we're gonna select tracks equal to to that hat that contained the name event. So container type is, we could think of that as kind of like the biggest macro level. But if we wanted this to be, you know, a media type, so if I wanted this to be automation or MIDI or tempo or chord tracks or groups, that would be kind of a media. So the media lives on so the media lives in a container, so we could specify what the container is or what the media is. So, but I'll try to come up with some uh, more videos on like Project Logical Editor now that it's been updated and released to the public. Uh, so I just see, uh, so from Jazz Dude, question, uh, maybe Greg could give us some info on using two Cubases at the same time. So I noticed that I was able to do it. It, it was that, you know, different systems. Uh, I'm not sure if it's officially in the license, but I've had, you know, Cubase, my Cubase license on my Mac and my personal studio PC running at the same time. So without any issues, you know, as people had expressed, you know, their feedback when the initial licensing system was rolled out, you know, Steinberg did modify it so that it wasn't calling home every 30 days and it was more than two licenses. Like Michael Pierce wanted it to be three licenses. So we communicated that to Steinberg and they modified uh, the licensing system so that it would, you know, uh, based on customer feedback on a lot of sources, especially forums and from the live stream comments as well. All right, so we see... Um, Uh, so question, how do you render out separate tracks for each drum sound when using a Halion MIDI drum loop, similar to how you showed rendering for the Groove Agent MIDI loop? All right, so let's open this up. So it's really, you know, think about it is it's not so much, uh, we just, as soon as it has the available, you know, the different drums are mapped to different tracks. You know, once you have that, then the rendering kind of works the same way, but let's go ahead and see if we could do it easily. Some of the stuff is easier in Groove Agent for drums, but we'll see. I think we could do it in Halion as well. Maybe a little bit of a different approach, but we'll take a look at it. Thank you for all the great questions. Okay, so let me just. All right, and let's see if we can get these mapped to different outputs. Um,
right? So So I think it's going to be for MIDI stuff. Let me just. We may have to come over here and add a new bus. And let's see if I do a new bus here. If So it's just gonna so and it might be easier if we had kind of our own samples they might be this could be kind of collected as a kit so let me just try creating my own samples quickly, but, let, but let's see. I'll just try quickly and I could maybe work on this over the weekend and show it on Tuesday. Yeah, so uh, I will see some of those kits may automatically just be um, set up where they're not individually samples. Um, but I think once you kind of break it apart to different samples that you'll be kind of all set with that and it'll be able to be rendered. But, you know, when you see Groove Agent and um, like, you know, a Groove Agent and some of the other instruments are, you know, probably better solutions for that. All right. Okay, so we see a question. Um, hey, Greg, I'm always learning something new from these live, from these Hangouts question. I'd like the ability to right click on a folder and add a new track to that folder. Is that possible? So let's go ahead and give it a shot. All right, 
married. So I think that this may go out of the folder, but let's see if we select within a track, within the folder track, it automatically gets added. Um, so if the folder is expanded, you could just, you know, right click to add tracks and then that will be placed within the folder. Uh, but let's see if I come here. I think if we do this, it will now add an audio track directly below the folder. So, but if the folder is open, it'll just kind of add directly within the folder, just like that. So while it's not right clicking on the folder itself, you know, you could right click and add a track within the folder. All right, so we see Gareth on the live stream. Thanks for joining us from Bilbao, Spain. I see that Pablo is out working again. All right. Just going through comments here. Um, so we just see, is it dangerous question? Is it dangerous to rescan my Cubase plugins? So no, you know, generally, uh, you know, your computer is not going to blow up. There is no, it may, sometimes it, when you start, you know, Cubase, it does like a little quality assurance test on each of the plugins and measures the latency of it. So the first time you do it, it may take longer, but you know, other than that, it's not going to really cause any problems. Okay, so you see uh, just a question. Um, hey, what are the four, the new four dots between the track list and the event display for? Um, so this, I think it's, so I'm not sure if it's just to show um, you know, it might be just to show, to delineate between them. Like sometimes depending on your project, if you had an offset you, where you could see where to grab. So I think it's, it might be just kind of a visual landmark between the two. So if like measure one, you know, is offset and we had it, you know, let's say it looked like that and you wanted to know where to grab where the end was. I think that's the intention so that we could resize depending on if the grid is lining up visually there where we can't see the grid point. So we could delineate between the grid and the the handle of the track control area. But I'm kind of mostly guessing with that, so. All right, so Nick is saying 108 watching and only 84 likes. Smash the like, smash the like, so. Okay, so we just see, um, hey, I'm unable to remove a plugin from a bus and then Cubase 12 freezes and I have to restart. So if you have a plugin that's been problematic, you know, you could start the program and hold down like alt control shift or command option plus shift. And then you have the option to uh, to start the program without like third party plugins. And at that point, you could, you know, open up the project, uh, remove 
the plugin while it's inactive and at that point choose to you know, save the project under a different name or save the project with the same name and then open it up with all the plugins active. So, uh, so you see, does Cubase have anything like the clip gain in Pro Tools that could be automated? Reducing plosives and S sounds has been a problem for me in Cubase. So really all you have to do is you know, any time that you want it to do clip gain, I mean, we actually kind of invented that whole concept. You know, we could come here, you could do like a quick shift X and, you know, so any time that you want it to just come, all you have to do is, I'll just make this a little larger so you could all see it. So, you know, if I come here, select a range, I'll hit shift plus X and then we could cut. And then as soon as we come right there, we could just... Uh, adjust your clip gain and we've been doing that for 20 some years so perfect for plosives and stuff like that um Okay, so we see a question from Jeff Sabelski. Uh, what would cause a gray out of insert plugins in the master bus in Nuendo in a very large project? I was using the inserts on the master bus only for a quick reference, and then they grayed out. So it could be that you have the check to make sure if you go to the constrained delay compensation in the lower left hand corner that you could turn on the constrained delay compensation and see it could be just that the late, those plugins on your master bus have enough latency where they could be bypassed. Um, so if we come here and I go to my master bus, we could see that now with constrained delay compensation enabled, I load up a large latent plugin like a multiband compressor that um, as soon as we come here and turn that off. It's usually kind of now bypassed. Um, so make sure that you uh, don't have the constrained delay compensation on. So give that a shot. So let's take a look. So usually that will bypass. Let me just add it. Try one more time. So some of the plugins will be bypassed when, let me just make sure it's not in live mode. So if it has a lot of latency in the plugin, so check that Jeff and let me know. See Alexa DeVoe saying way smarter to route to via two sound cards. I never thought of this. So yeah, I tried all sorts of early options on and that was the least nightmarish for me. And I just kind of in a set and forget mode. All right, so we see, uh, can you talk a bit about printing reverbs and delays? Um, so there's a number of ways of doing it. So let's say if we have, I'll just uh, revert this project and let's say I'll add reverbs on. So let's say we're here and I wanna put just a reverb on my bus, so I will. So say I'll go to my snare top and let's just add a big reverb. All 
All right, so now when you come over here to the snare. So if we wanted to print that, you know, all we'd have to do is just say, okay, it, when we do our export audio mix down, we could just come right over here and just choose to print the room works. So at this point, we could just say, okay, I want to take just a small section. Uh, let's create a new audio track with that. So we'll export audio. I think I did it in real time, so I'll, okay. All right, so now we'll come here and listen to So that's just our reverb that's printed. So we could print all of our effects channels independently if you wanted to. Let's see, Greg sneezes are the go-to samples for Ian Kirkpatrick. So I think Ian would find that funny. So it was like, yeah, it was, I, I really enjoyed visiting him at his house. So it, was, it was a lot of fun. He was just like, I can't believe Greg is at my house. It's just amazing, you know? So it was a lot of fun. I'm a huge fan of his work and he does amazing things. All right, uh, so we have a question. Uh, can you please explain how to add universal me? I, I assume MIDI controller. I have mini lab from Arturia. I added it, I added it and it recognized it, the buttons knobs, but when I open VST, the knobs don't move from zero. So, you know, as you have controllers, you know, one thing to check, because um, you could define the focus for controllers. So let's say if I'm here, um, you could go to the focus and you could say, I want it to be, so we see this like quick control focus area. Uh, so you want to make sure that, you know, it's not set to track focus only or plug in windows. So, you know, when it's set to track and plug in windows, if I have a track selected, you know, it will do the quick controls for the particular track. So if I come here, we can see like, volume pan and then when I make a plugin window active or a synthesizer window active at that point it will do the quick controls assigned to this so you may open up something but maybe you have to click on the window depending on your focus settings here to determine what the quick controls are actually controlling so let me know if that helps All right, so we just see, uh, thank you, Greg, but how can I copy a panel with all the configuration to the next MIDI channels? So let's take a look. Uh, I think he's going back to our device panels. So let's come here to, our MIDI device manager, let's see if our, So let's say we want to do our device panels. Okay, 
Okay, so let's go ahead and just set up a couple of different things. Let's see if we get it copied. So just all right, so Let's see if we could copy these over. So if we do it one panel at a time. So there may be a way of doing it, um, but you know, if we come here, let's just say, okay, I want. So you might have to manually just kind of make it, but once you make it once and save it, I think you'll be okay. Then you could align kind of the different elements here. So let's say we're in channel two for this parameter. So you can make kind of all 16, just kind of like that. But I think once you, do it once that, you know, um, I'm not sure if there's a way to copy those or you have to make it all kind of at once, but I could do a little more research if you want to email me at clubcubase at steinberg.de. All right, so just seeing uh, just a question, I think this might have been directed to Michael Pierce, uh, says, uh, I wanted something like an automation line that only affects the particular event before it hits the inserts. Um, so, you know, we showed kind of like the clip gain where we could, you know, take, uh, you know, particular areas here and do that. But another method that you could use, uh, and I'll just make this a little larger here, is if you just grab the pencil, and if you wanted this to be before the actual event here, you could just say, okay, I have my volume, and I just wanted the volume to be lower for there. You could just select your pencil tool and just be able to kind of adjust volume here, and that will be before the channel hits the fader. So you could do kind of and this is kind of like older, what they used to call dynamic events from earlier versions of Cubase. So let me know if that helps. All right, so we have a question. Can you uh, change the name of the audio track after you've imported the audio track in Cubase 12? Um, so all you have to do, let's say we import an audio file. OK, 
Okay, and I'll just do this on a new project here. Okay, so this is called base geo underscore one. So if you want to change the name of the track, you could just double click and change the track. Uh, if you want to change the event name to the track, hold down control and before you hit enter, and then you could rename and you could also rename the file here or the description directly there from the info line. So if you wanted to rename the file, you could do that very easily there. Um, so we see uh, just a question from Jeff Sabelski. Greg, you opened so many different projects for us for demonstrations. Do you go through a routine to close them all without saving when our session is over? So generally, I'm like the one person like in my demo computer. I'd never want auto save on because I always want it to start from a known point. Um, so I just make sure to close and delete all audio files and don't save, don't save, don't save uh, at the end. So yeah, sometimes I'll have like 20 projects open. So, but that way I could always kind of start from a, a known point for demonstration purposes. On my personal computer, I have auto save on for every 10 minutes or so, but my demo computer is never, so. So we see Nick uh, is just saying thanks for the groups, you know, recording the audio out. He's saying he got as far as sending to a group and his brain cramped up. So it happens. We see Michael Pierce is out going to do some tutoring. So just reading through comments. All right, so we see, uh, I saw so many videos about bass drum, especially the EQing, they're always different. What's the right way to tune? Is there a trick? You know, so one thing is, you know, um, every, every song is gonna be different. So a lot of times, you know, so many people look for like, always EQ this frequency on this instrument, always do it. And then, you know, and you know, I, I went, you know, pre COVID I would do a lot of traveling and then I would just ask people, I'm like, well, what if the song is in a different key and, or what if the, the kick drum is tuned differently or you have to tune the kick drum because differently because of what's going on in the piano or the bass um, so every song is going to present different things. So there's a lot of people that kind of use a cookie cutter approach and they just EQ stuff because they saw it on a YouTube video. And, you know, I always try to think of it as, you know, if you need to EQ, that's great, you know, but, you know, don't just put on plugins just because for the sake of doing it. So, um, you know, so there really isn't a trick to just listen um, and, you know, some people like EQing on, you know, a console because they're not seeing the waveform. They're not seeing, you know, the effect of the EQ and they EQ differently when they do it just by ear as opposed to 
you know, worrying about particular frequencies. They just kind of dial it in until it, it sounds good to them. So no real tricks. All right, so we have Guido checking in from Argentina. Thanks for joining us. Okay, so we have a question from Pascal. It says, I'm using Cubase Pro 11. Uh, and I have a question for e-license, soft e-license gives me an error and I can't redeem if I'm using Windows 10 Pro. What do you recommend to do? So Cubase 11 Pro, uh, that level is gonna require a USB e-licensor, it's not soft e-license. So you'll have to get a USB e-licensor to run that version. Um, so, you know, so you can get this Steinberg USB e-licensor uh, for, and that's required for artist and pro versions. You know, now with Cubase 12, we don't require the USB e licensor. It's moved on to a new system, but with Cubase Pro 11, it will require the the actual USB e licensor as opposed to a uh, soft e license that's stored on a hard drive with the computer. Oh, and also, if you're just seeing like a soft e-license error message and you do have a USB e-licensor, um, you know, try just to install, to reinstall the e-licensor program and that will often kind of take care of that. Sometimes it gets triggered after an operating system update. Sorry if I misunderstood. And I'm just also seeing kind of a further follow up. Uh, the question is, but my redeem code is not working also. So once you have the, you know, check your e-licensor program and you should see the, uh, you know, once the license is on the USB key at that point, you don't have to re-enter it again. You just reinstall the program. All the licensing is completed because the license is stored on the USB e-licensor. Chatfield jumped on me, so. Let me just find my place. Okay, uh, so we have a question. Hi, is there a way to turn audio drums to MIDI? So we'll jump back to this project here. Okay, so let's say I wanted to do like drum replacement uh, and replace drum sounds that maybe we didn't like as much. So I will come here. So I'll start with the kick drum. So let's say I have a track with Groove Agent loaded and I have just a kit. So I'm gonna leave that track selected, double click, and we'll go into our hit points. We can choose to edit hit points. And then we'll see this little create tab uh, in 12, but you'll just see. And then at this point, we'll choose to uh, create MIDI notes. I want to retain the dynamic velocity and let's put it at C1 and hit okay. 
And now all of our kicks are being triggered by Groove Agent here. And if I wanted to make that louder, tune it. So it created the track on the selected track, and now we have our kick. So that's all you have to do, and you can do that for the snare. We've even done hi-hats on other live streams, and it worked way better than it should have. So. So Gareth is saying howdy, Greg. So hope you're doing well, Gareth. Should have a chance to work on a lot on that new song uh, over the weekend. Looking forward to it. And we know that Pablo is currently throwing drumsticks at singers. I never irritated the drummer for that reason. Learned that early on. All right, so we see Avery Music saying Greg Cubase 12 is on fire. So that's good. All right, um, so we see, does the tempo track question, does the tempo track speed up video material inside of Cubase along with the music? If so, how can I change it to only affect the music, export the music, and then create a new project with the video? So the video is just gonna be playback, so when we change tempos or we do, uh, it's not gonna affect the playback length of the video, so. All right, wonderful to see Walter Blackledge from St. Louis Club Cubase. And he mentions that he's enjoying Cubase 12. I spoke with Joe Blasting Game yesterday. So thinking of you guys. Jazz Dude just saying, if you like this informative hangout, subscribe and don't forget to hit the like button. All right, so we see uh, Samson Strike just asking his question. Uh, is there a way to get old VST2 plugins in Nuendo slash Cubase 11 plus? So there's no problem running VST2 plugins. Uh, so 32-bit plugins are, you know, haven't been supported for several versions. Some people will get a, a wrapper like JBridge that, that can add to some system instability. So just be aware of that, but you know, some confusion has been out with uh, Cubase 12 uh, because on Mac OS, if you have an M1 processor, that won't run VST2 plugins natively. You'd have to run it in Rosetta mode, uh, but that's just only on Mac with M1 processors. So that's why you see a lot of companies now migrating to uh, VST3 plugins. But, you know, so old, old VST2 plugins that are 64-bit um, will still work without any problems on Windows and Intel-based Macs. Okay, so Tiago is just saying that uh, audio warp in the project Windows improved my workflow to align my choir works. That's great. Thanks for letting us know. See Samson Strike just saying, uh, yes, the 32 bit plugin. So, you know, check um, if you really have to do it and it's not recommended because it will add to a lot of system problems. You know, you could do JBridge, but a lot of those, you know, try to find more contemporary, you know, versions if you can. So.
Okay, so we, we see Steve Allen on the live stream. G great to see you, Steve. Uh, and his question is, I always have a bar offset of two or three in my projects. Uh, when using Groove Agent 5 to follow transport, its transport grooves are offset and it is two or three bars higher. Just my Cubase OCD. Um, so I think, so let's say if we have, um, so let me just set a offset here. So we'll do like a three bar offset. And I'll add in a kit into Groove Agent. Okay, so let's say, and we'll sync, we'll follow the transport here. So let's say as we're going to we'll start at measure nine. Yeah, so I see that the offset here is gonna be not taken into account. Um, so it's, it could be a very first world problem, but I'll, I'll mention it nonetheless that it's uh, not uh, the playback here isn't following. So it's tough having OCD anyway. I see John Koskins having fun with his SSD drives not being recognized by motherboards. All right, that's a bummer. I had one slot I was putting an M2 drive in and didn't like that one slot. Um, my dog bit the dongle, but it works. Uh, if he bites it yet, I'm going to, uh, scold him. What happens if my dog bites the dongle so much that it no longer works? Will I shoot him or will I buy a new dongle? Um, depending on how much your dog did with the dongle, you know, you may want to transfer the licenses to something fresh that maybe you didn't have dog saliva on it. So but they're pretty resilient. Uh, you know, I've used the same USB E licensor for about, uh, 17 years. Um, so it's been around the world, probably 2 million miles flown with it. Okay, so we see Mark Rabin's back in. Okay, just... Uh, so you just see from Graham Witcher, uh, the Verve soft piano is wonderful. sounds fab. However, it uses more CPU than any other VST in Cubase. So I haven't found it to be too bad. Um, I've only used it on a few projects, but you know, there could be, um, you know, it is doing a lot of stuff and it was kind of interesting to Verve was actually done with kind of a mechanical sampling system. So it actually had like a robot that would hit the keys so that you could have the same exact velocity. And so you didn't have to have a human sit there and hit, hit the key and hold their breath forever, you know. All 
Okay, so Volker just saying he started with an Atari program 24. Don't ask me about gigabytes. So. See Samson Strikes just saying best times ever in, in DAW, just rejoined music production, setting up new studio in Windows 11, plus soft, soft tube console slash fader and some USB controllers and TC plugins. All right. Welcome back to music production. All right. So we see question uh, how to program a MIDI controller slider to be CC11. So generally it's gonna be done in the MIDI controller itself. Um, if you have a, let's say if we have a, a, you know, a fader that you notice, you know, that you want that is transmitting something or it's fixed to something else, we could use like the input transformer. So let's say if I have a particular fader here, I'm gonna figure out what MIDI message it's sending out by going to the MIDI monitor. So as soon as we go to the MIDI monitor, I could come here um, and you could just say, you know, as we come here, let's see if I have this set up. It's not liking my Nectar controller today. But, you know, so it's really kind of whatever is being transmitted out. But let's say if you, you know, you move the face, the slider on your controller, um, and then it's only like, let's say it's controller one, and you want to turn controller one into controller 11. So as soon as you would go to a MIDI track, you could go to like the input transformer on version 12. It's here. Uh, in other versions, it's going to be right here, this little squiggly line. And what this would enable you to do is to take any incoming MIDI message. So we could say, I wanted to turn, um, we wanted to transform type is equal to MIDI controller. And what we wanted to do, let's say we had MIDI controller one being transmitted and we wanted to, at that point, turn that into MIDI controller 11. At this point, we would just say how we're going to transform that is we're going to take value two and then we'll say add 10. So it, this way it'll turn... MIDI controller one, add 10 values to the MIDI controller, or we'll say value one rather, um, and we'll choose add 10. So this way, whatever is spitting out MIDI controller one will now spit out MIDI controller 11. So you could just set up a preset and there's probably uh, factory presets for this like, um, change pitch bend to CC1, change, uh, you know, so uh, so you, you could do stuff like that as well. So, uh, but really it's, you know, you can transform the incoming MIDI message, but it's really up to the controller of what MIDI message is actually being sent out. See, Samson also has an old Focusrite Liquid Sapphire E207 near fields by Dynamics headphones. And he's loving his sound, so that's great. If you did it a long time ago, you realize how great it is now. Okay, so I just see uh, your noise floor is so low, I can hear traffic outside, nice stream quality. So yeah, I, our neighbors are getting some work done. I think they're 
they had a little bit of grass left, so they're going to turn it into a driveway. So they don't seem to like grass. See, Jazz dude just mentioning he remembers buying a base sample CD at three hundred dollars. They're probably happy for it. All right, so we have Chris Hallam checking in from Columbia, South Carolina. Thanks for joining us today. Okay, just reading through. Some comments here. Thanks for all the great questions. Okay, so you just see, uh, when I import an audio instrumental into Cubase 12 and I want to define its original time, Cubase does not define a static time for me. It begins to vary in time. How can I solve it? Okay, so let's say I'll just jump to a different project here. Um, let's see if I have it in my recent list. Okay, so we see uh, when I import an audio instrumental into Cubase 12, I want to define its original time. Cubase does not define a static time for me, and it begins to vary in time. How can I solve it? Okay, so I think probably what's going on is the original file, it sounds like maybe the original file was varying in tempo. So let's say if I have this example here and I want it to be static time, so what I'm gonna do is go to my project and we'll just say, let's get to our tempo detection. Analyze it. I'll do a quick offbeat correction. So then what I want to do is we see that it's gonna have varying tempos here. So if I wanted this to be a steady tempo, what I'd have to do is go to my audio menu to advanced and we'll say set definition from tempo. And once that's done, now you could just set a steady tempo. So you can see the original tempo here. And here's the tempo that I just kind of typed in. So if I want it to be faster, 156. So if the original file has varying tempo and you drop it in, you know, the original file will kind of get out of time. So if it's changing, you need to do a tempo detection and then at that point go to audio to advanced uh, and we'll see set definition from tempo. And at that point, it will just be able to uh, play back at a, at a perfect steady tempo. Okay, so you just see, Greg, I have a USB license, but keep saying that there's no USB available. Sound found, says eight, my computer. Um, so yeah, definitely try reinstalling the e-licensor software. Let me 
All right, so we see Petty just says, unfortunately, he needs to pick up his daughter. Thanks for the great explanations. Cubase 12 is awesome. So, yeah, my son's getting off from his bus stop right in about 10 minutes or so. My wife, my wife will get him this afternoon. All right, uh, so we see, can you convert an audio drum loop with multiple drum sounds, i.e. kick, snare, hi-hat, et cetera, to individual MIDI sounds? Uh, how would you do that? So if you wanted to do something like that for like a particular drum loop, okay, so let's say I have this loop here. Um, you know, what you could do is we could do this in um, the sampler track or directly. So let's say if I just want to drag, I go to my sampler control and I'll just drag this in. And then we'll go to slice. So at this point, um, it's now sliced up the audio and we see this little MIDI icon and I'm just gonna drag this MIDI over. And now as we listen to it, each of the rhythmically significant points of the audio file has been sliced. So as we listen to like the original loop, So, but at this point, if we wanted to, you know, be creative and kind of flip the loops around. Scientifically, of course. So now we can see what this sounds like. So you could do stuff like that. So um, that's one way of doing if you have a loop and you want to kind of break apart the individual uh, like transients or the beats or the hits, you could do it like that. All right, so we see from uh, Matt Elliston just uh, mentioning, just wanted to thank Steinberg slash Yamaha, Yamaha after hearing about the licensing discussions for not going down the subscription route. This and the option of upgrading is much better and is excellent value. So yeah, you know, Yamaha is smart and lets Steinberg kind of, you know, make those decisions. Uh, so, you know, but Steinberg, you know, does listen and that's why we do these types of live streams to, you know, make sure that we're getting customer feedback and stuff like that. Um, all right. So we have a question. Uh, is there a way to find specific sound from original track? I mean, the snare drum from track I like, or do I have to find it manually? Um, so if you're like hear a track and you say, Oh, I want that snare drum, you know, so it used to be a little easier, uh, like in the nineties, you know, it used to be, you know, for a long time it was, Oh, name that D 50 patch or name that Korg M one sound. And you, you would kind of recognize a lot of the samples because people, uh, were using, you know, the similar tools and then people would get to the point where they wouldn't use any presets because it was so it almost turned into such a cliche. So if you're looking to like have a way of Cubase to automatically identify which snare was used in a track, I don't think anything's going to do that. And, you know, there'll be a lot of manipulation just to uh, make sure that it's harder for someone else to reproduce because that's kind of 
the value that the engineer or programmer brings to the project. See, Samson Strike just saying he started in 1989 with Cubase and a 1040 ST with the D50, but there's a highlight I now missed, the interactive phrase synthesizer. Please help. So there isn't an equivalent, but uh, the developer who did that, Werner Kroc, he's still with the company. You know, his name was on the very first Cubase. Uh, he's still with the company, so maybe it'll be his baby to do. You know, he's, he's older now, but uh, still, you know, the guy is amazing. So, always love getting a chance to hang out with him, but haven't seen him since I've been in Germany since COVID started. I see Gareth is going to feed his daughter. Say hi to Lola for us. All right, so we see question. Uh, may I import? May I import my old templates into the new MIDI remote configuration? So you know, templates. You know, uh, by definition, are kind of when we go to uh, like new projects here, and you know, we could open up templates. Uh, so those aren't really tied into it. If it's going with our studio setup, like to our generic remote. Um, you know, so if we add a generic remote here, um, doo -doo -doo. all right, so if we add a generic remote, so all these XML files, they don't immediate, they don't translate over to the new, uh, MIDI remote system. And the intention of the new MIDI remote system is that it would, uh, kind of replace all that and you know and i realized that if you spent a lot of time working on creating generic remotes this isn't a pleasant process but the process of defining uh functions in the new midi remote is so much better uh so you could do it in literally just a fraction of the time so um you know it's like i want to hit this button i i, I open up the mapping assignment I want to hit this button. I want to assign that button to a function. Like, let's say, okay, I want it to come over here and I wanted this to be uh, for record enable. So now I could just record enable on that particular channel. I could just right click and apply that mapping. And that's all you have to do for assigning. Or you could actually search for functions and see all your key commands. So it's not gonna automatically translate the generic remote. I think we'll see the new MIDI remote system kind of replacing that, but we didn't want to turn it all off and you know kill like people's entire setups that they've you know spent days configuring. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, when we record MIDI from Groove Agent and we have MIDI input on Groove Agent, when I hit playback with MIDI input on Groove Agent, I get double the sound. I have to turn MIDI input to all. Um, is there a right way around this? So if you want to capture, you know, so if you want to capture, you know, Groove Agent's kits, um, so when we come over here, You know, so a lot of times people may have All right, so let's say if I'm here and I have this set to 
be my Groove Agent MIDI output. You know, we can see that everything is recording, so I don't necessarily hear doubles, but you know, if you want it to capture the MIDI output from Groove Agent, you know, just once you have everything kind of set up, you know, just do the do the capture once, then you don't need the MIDI input to be configured for the for the input port. And you could set it to all MIDI inputs. So once it's been captured, you know, you, you could just switch that back to all MIDI inputs. Uh, but, you know, but when I just did it, I didn't hear any doubling with it. So let me know if I did something differently than you. Okay, so I just see, uh, hi Greg, when I render and place my BFD drums or superior drummer, why does it only render eight channels only? Is there a way to turn my multi-output MIDI drums to audio? Um, so it should, you know, I'm not sure if there's a limitation, like, you know, when you get a groove agent here, we could have, again, up to uh, 32 outputs. So I'm not sure how many outputs are within those particular drum machines, but it's or drum programs. Uh, but there's no limit that's being imposed with Cubase. So again, if I just take this um, and I have my routing in Groove Agent set up here. So let's say, okay, I have, you know, and maybe it's just a routing issue in those programs, but I'll just kind of set this up And I will go ahead and render in place. So I'll just say with channel settings, that they will all just be kind of mapped out for me just like that. So if, you know, so as long as the outputs are assigned in the instrument, it should automatically just render in place for all of those particular outputs. Let's see, just comment from Uno Memento saying, if I tried to learn all the features and shortcuts of Cubase, uh, there'd be no time left for actual work. All you have to do is take the features you really need. You know, the one thing, if I could pass on advice <clears throat> to anyone who's doing it, you know, anytime that you grab, some, a lot of times when I'm doing live streams, I'll grab <clears throat> for the menu so that people have the benefit of seeing it. But anytime that you go for a menu, try to, you know, and go for functions, see and if, if it has a keyboard shortcut, you know, learn that keyboard shortcut when you go to the menu. Uh, and then from there, you could be, you know, if you start migrating to keyboard shortcuts, you could work, you know, incredibly fast with Cubase. So, all right. So we see just nice comments from Samson Strike, and we're glad you could join us on the live stream today.
All right, so we see how can do a melody using a keyboard and play in the same key. All right, so let's say I wanted to, uh, I'll just jump back to a different project here. So if we always want it to play in a particular key, um, there is a scale assistant that you could access uh, directly in the uh, MIDI key editor. So let's open up the project here real quick and we'll show you how you do this so you can restrict yourself so you can't play out of key. So let's say, okay, I just want to come here to a Rhodes patch. Um, so I'm going to create just kind of a container part here for our MIDI. So I'm just going to go and, and then once we're in our key editor here, we can go to our scale assistant. So I could say, I want this to be in the key of E minor, you know, or we'll just say, you know, E major, and then we have snap live input. So at this point, if I just start playing anything that I play that's not in E major, uh, and then as we've recorded it, it will automatically just, um, you know, we could come right over here and that will snap the live input so that it won't, uh, I'll just turn auto quantize off here and do it one more time here. So we'll just set this to, So once you have this snap live input, that will automatically just make sure that any of the notes that you just played will actually just be within the key. So try the snap live input mode. All right, so um, so it says I installed my libraries on an external SSD drive. None of the Howling and Sonic presets and Retrolog uh, sh show up. I work on Mac. Can you help me, please? Um, okay, so all right, so if you go to you know, make sure that, you know, if you go to the, so let's go to the Steinberg uh, Library Manager. So as we look at this, um, so you could just kind of see your retro log sounds here. So if you know where you installed them to, try double clicking on them or right clicking and saying open in Steinberg Library Manager. So it should be a .vst sound file folder and then make sure that they show up here and then that should automatically make the association between them. Um, so we see a um, question. Hey, Greg, does Cubase have aux tracks like other programs? And if so, does it work the same way? So I think weird. I don't know the air program well, but I think, you know, we could send a track to a an effects channel if we, you know, if we wanted to have that track be routed to a reverb and that would be done through our sends here. So once we come over here and look at our sends uh, and, you know, we could also route it to a group. So if we wanted to, you know, I think some programs may kind of consolidate those, but we could have kind of differences between routing to an aux send that's going to effects or routing to a group, but we could come over here and route you know, through sends to either groups or to, um, you know, to the 
uh, effect sends here. So as soon as we come here, we could, you know, route it to different places. So I think, you know, it'll get you, the audio will get sent to the group or to the, the aux, uh, to the effects track. So I think it's same thing, but just different terminology. All right, so I think I reached the end of the chat field. Let me, I know we had some questions that were mailed in, so let me jump to those. Thanks for all the great questions. Okay, so we had a question that was uh, mailed in. So it was um, how to open a specific automation lane using the project logical editor, like MIDI CC1 on a track. Okay, so let's say I'm going to come and on my MIDI track here, I'm just gonna draw in some modulation. Okay, and let's say when we come over here, we could see the modulation um, show up. So let's say if I'm here, we could just now have that as automation. Okay, so our modulation. So let's say, and I think I made a preset for this in the project logical editor. So if you always wanted to activate and select, open up and edit the CC data as modulation, uh, as automation and not have to kind of constantly open it up and search for it. So let's come over to our project menu and we can do this pretty easily using the new project logical editor. So as we go to set up here, um, I think, all right, let me just come back here real quick. I'll just show this. Show this here real quick. Okay. All right, so let's say we have our automation here for modulation. And, you know, let's say we also typically have volume, you know, so let's say we have this and we want to now, let's go to our project logical editor. Let's see if I saved it. All right. Okay, so let's go ahead and I'll just create it. So what I want to do is to um, do a pre-process. So when I do this, I want to go to automation and I want to say open uh, automation on select or show automation on selected channel, on selected tracks, okay? And now what I want to do is we're gonna say, uh, We want to select, and our media type is equal to automation, and the name contains, and we'll say CC1. Okay, and now let's hit apply. So as soon as I hit apply now, what it'll do is it will automatically just open up uh, so it's going to take the selected track 
And even if we have a hundred different parameters, I'll take this selected track and we'll say, we want to open up the automation track on the selected channel. So we're And then we're gonna select the automation and if the name contains CC1, select that particular track for automation. All right, uh, so in doing the index for Tuesday's live stream, I think I realized I misunderstood a particular question about how to carry over track names to uh, when we have rendering of or exporting selected events. So let's say if I wanted to include the track name, so I'm sorry that I misunderstood. So let's say I have you know, these events as, you know, future, whatever that we have selected here. And we have this set to loops as our track name. So I'm going to select the particular events here. And, you know, in Cubase 12, there's a new function for the render uh, or export selected events. Um, and if, and, you know, we could use a custom name uh, but what I want to do is to do a custom name, uh, but I want it to just take the uh, track name. So now I'm just gonna drag the track name down. So now when we do our naming schemes, uh, the track name for loops will automatically be embedded into the particular audio files as we export. So click on the naming scheme and then you can see the setups and this will allow you to add a project name, free text. So if you wanted to just put today's date, you know, your name, whatever, you could just kind of, or put a counter on it as well. Uh, so at this point we could just say, you know, it'll be loops this and we'll say our free text and then we'll just come here and we'll just call this club Cubase. So we can say loops 001 club Cubase, loops 002 club Cubase. So you could have counters for that. So just click on the naming scheme icon there. Uh, so sorry for misunderstanding that. Okay, so we see, uh, hi Greg, thanks for all your info provided over these years. Uh, currently I'm using platform M plus to control the mixer in Cubase Pro 11. Uh, if you change the viewing zone of a track, uh, I example from middle to right, the tracks, no follow tracks, uh, channel numbers will not be sequential and platform M plus faders will be messed up. Uh, you see the same thing happening. So a lot of times, you know, if it's kind of a control surface, I'm not familiar with the uh, M plus, um, but a lot of times, you know, if we have, let's say a number of audio tracks, you know, many controls, I think Mackie controllers, you know, they, you know, if I select a track here, I don't think Mackie controls have the ability to automatically bank to the selected track. You could do the track selection from the Mackie control and, and initiate it there, but it doesn't follow. So that's probably, you know, so if it's working under a Mackie control protocol, that's probably why it's, you know, if you wanted it to follow here, that it's not following and kind of matching up, you know, with different controllers like a CC121, you know, that's not an issue. It's designed to work that way, but Mackie controls for the most part don't. I believe. All right, so we see a question. Uh, is there a way to change the active cycle marker color? Mine turns black when it's selected and the same color is the track background. So I, I haven't found a way to, uh, so if we have a marker track here, so just come here, I'll just add a marker track and We'll just add a cycle marker based on that. So when it's selected, um, it is black. Um, so, but you know, it is slightly different, but just kind of like the editor uh, for like the guidelines that Best Screen Jesus asked about with the dark background. It may not be as obvious when it's selected, uh, but I'll make sure to kind of pass that along as well.
Okay. Um, so we have a question. Uh, when I try to import track settings from one project into another in Nuendo 1103, it works fine at 44K and 48K, but at 88.2, uh, all the audio disappears in that project window when I'm importing track mixer data. Uh, the only workaround I found is to re-import the audio from my project after track data. Any other suggestions? Uh, and have you seen this issue before? So let me just turn a project into an 88.2 project. Probably should have done this before. Uh, but I think we can do it pretty quickly. So let's just change the sample rates here on a particular project. So change sample rates. I'm just going to go to my project setup and let's choose 88.2. All right, so we'll convert the audio tracks. Uh, we'll keep the original files and we'll keep them at the same sample positions. We'll say no. So now when we play back, uh, we'll be at 88.2. And we just So I'm going to save this as Bicycle 88.2. Okay, so now I'm going to close this project. I'll do a new project. And I'm going to import tracks from project here. And we'll do our bicycle 88.2. Select all and So I don't have any problems uh, with that. Um, you know, one of the things that you may want to try just out of curiosity is to see if it's maybe uh, one particular track or if there's a plugin that might be acting up or, you know, try, a, you know, you may be able to import several tracks at a time and, you know, maybe there's one track that's being a culprit with it, but it seemed to kind of work as expected here. All right, uh, so we have a question. Uh, is it possible to configure the stop play key command that if I double click on the space key that it functions as to play from start and when the space key is hit uh, one clicked play to stop from the current cursor position? All right, so I think if we come over here, let's say if I hit stop using the zero key on my numeric keypad, um, it's kind of set up that way. So there's a so if you wanted to toggle the preference for that there is a preference that you could toggle back and forth for this um so you'd see it under transport uh and then you'll see return to start position on stop but if you use a, the zero key on a numeric keypad so i use the enter to play and then i hit zero to stop and then if I hit zero again that will automatically go back to the spot you know to the particular behavior so the behavior on the zero key will probably do what you want instead of the space bar can either function either or so but give that a shot all right let me go back to our live chats again thanks for all the great questions uh, and if you've learned something new make sure you do hit the like button and you know we do these live streams uh, twice a week on Tuesdays and fr and Fridays. All right, let me just jump back to where we were.
So we got about 15 minutes left or so. We see Michael Pierce is able to sneak back in. All right. All right, just reading through comments. All right. Uh, so, just see um, what is what are the benefits of direct threads? How to optimize thread split on heavy loads? You know, so most of the time, you know, you don't really have to do much inside of Cubase for that. Um, you know, because Cubase will handle it. But some things that can, you know, some plugins may only utilize um, particular cores, and you may, like with an in instrument plugin like Halion. I'm sure you could probably do it in contact and other sample players. Uh, if you load up, like, you know, you may have to go in and tell the sampler to use multiple cores uh, independently. So, and that, you know, so sometimes people don't do that and they load up 30 instruments in one sampler and it's bogging down your system and it's really just bogging down one core that's making their system crawl. But you really don't have to do... Um, you really don't have to do much on it from a user side to get the benefits of Cubase. All right, so we have Raj checking in, says greetings from Canada. In Cubase 12, any musical pattern in MIDI track is automatically playing according to chord track. It's amazing. Can you explain more? So, you know, if you have, you know, different MIDI tracks, and I'll show you just a quick example here of one that's always a lot of fun. Um, So generally, you have to kind of enable the, the MIDI tracks to follow the chord track. Uh, but once you have it kind of done, you can do some pretty scary things with it. So let's say we'll listen to... So let's say, you know, I just wanted to have all these tracks follow the chord track, but I could just come over here and say, okay, instead of it being in G major, let's make it G minor. Let's make it a D minor. And so now we could just take all these tracks. Just change the chords. So, you know, and to get the MIDI tracks to follow the chords, you just go to the chords tab in the inspector, and at this point, you could just 
uh, switch it from off to chords and scales or just to chords or just to the scales. So. We're glad that Sable is able to check in for Mark Raven. Everyone's missing Sable. Well, I see Mark Rabin uh, just got a new iPhone. He's considering getting Cubasis for iPhone. So yeah, it's a, you know, if you wanted to have a DAW on your phone, it's by far the best one. Uh, and there's, you know, it's, it's pretty scary what you could do. Uh, I use on my Samsung phone with the Android version. So. All right, so I think I might be at the end of the questions. I'll give it another minute. We'll see if other questions kind of sneak in. See, Michael Teams called the piece to Brandenburg Gracchetto. So, like, I get to to kill Bach pieces. So. We'll just wait in our minute. If not, we'll wrap up just a couple minutes early. Um, so once again, we'll see everyone. Um, all right, so see really kind words from Mark Raven says, thanks from all of us. Uh, you're really too kind and way too smart and talented. We appreciate you, Greg. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It's a great way to kick off a weekend. Okay. All right, so with that, I'll go ahead and wrap up. Thanks again for all the wonderful questions. Um, and we'll see everyone back on Tuesday's live stream. And everyone, please stay safe and healthy. And let me just switch over my window here to the correct. All right, everyone stay safe and healthy, and we'll see everyone Tuesday. Goodbye.